Good afternoon, everyone. To the distinguished officials and community of the Mindanao State University, IIT, Mindanao Development Authority, and also the Philippine Institute of Development Studies, and to some of our guests and colleagues who are present here today, and even for um, some government representatives, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to present at the 8th Mindanao Policy Research Forum. I am Jern, as introduced earlier, and with me is Professor Mata. I am sure that everyone would at least agree that the pandemic highlighted the gap that existed between the rich and marginalized communities. And I think um, the earlier presenter uh, was able to um, highlight that enough in her presentation. And I think um, our presentation by Doc Mata uh, would, as you would see, would clearly support this. No, We may have used a different approach, but we came up with almost a similar finding. Indeed, everyone has been affected, especially at the height of the pandemic. Hence, everyone complied to the guidelines that was being implemented. And people would say that Filipinos are on the same boat, or I know how hard it is for you. So we tried to be more emphatic, yes. But one who would temporarily stop no, at office work while enjoying the leisure of being in the comfort of their homes or at least still eat more three times a day may not exactly know or understand what the families of marginalized had experienced. So this is what our research project was interested in knowing. Losing the only source of income, not being able to provide at the very least food for their families. This was the great divide. So imagine if every guideline would genuinely be inclusive enough to have a real touch of reality to the masses. Imagine if the marginalized are heard more. What if we actually make sure that survival comes first and becomes the priority? So this is our recommendation and how we can possibly, or at least feasibly, take from fury to justice. This afternoon, I would like to invite your attention to re-examine the fury, which for purposes of discussion pertains to the chaos and inequalities which the pandemic caused when it comes to public health services. During the height of the dreaded coronavirus, several mishaps and challenges were unraveled from both the health sector and general public. Basic health care has been almost inaccessible because of two reasons. We found that number one, hospitals have already reached full capacity, especially with COVID cases. And as far as we can remember, ever since the pandemic started, we have a mandate that everyone entering the hospital, whether patient or watcher, shall do a COVID-19 test. Positive individuals shall be isolated or even be transferred to a hospital that accepts COVID-19 positive patients. Another reason we found for its inaccessibility is a triage system. Common illness symptoms prevent people from being admitted to non-COVID facilities. And to be specific, colds, fevers, diarrhea, cough, these symptoms can be connected to any illness, not just COVID-19. But having just one of those might cost you of being admitted or checked. To add to this, there has been an obvious neglect to other diseases like rabies, cancer, diabetes, and other equally deadly diseases that require immediate medical attention. The whole world literally stopped because of lockdowns. And not to mention here in the Philippines where we had a series of them, almost two years, the longest in the world, of only allowing working individuals to go outside. Have you remembered the time when only one or two people in the family can go outside to buy food? And that's if they're lucky enough to have money. But what about those who are relying on food reliefs? How about those in need who didn't receive ayuda? Despite the efforts of our healthcare workers, COVID-19 cases remain almost uncontrollable. Surges cause untimely responses, even to COVID-19-related emergencies, and work fatigue to our frontliners. On top of this crisis are the spread of misinformation and disinformation that enraged our Filipino people and caused fear in society. So from time to time, the limitations of activities to be done and places to go to lessen. Let's just say start or mid-2021, people can now go out and travel as long as they get tested from COVID. Online school is already available and people can opt to work from home, but have we noticed that 
there is still a divide even in this context because online school should have solved the education issue for everyone. But obviously, not everyone has the luxury of having stable internet. Not everyone can afford a good setup at home. Work from home doesn't cover all employees, especially frontliners, and some people needed to risk themselves every day to travel to work, exposing themselves and their families at home to the virus. So this is something that we ask again ourselves. Is this entirely fair? Is this what we call better or there's something more that we can do? So that made us curious. The entire Philippines, people in different backgrounds would like to do something to help. Everyone tried to help. Uh, our policymakers and government officials created these guidelines that we needed to prevent the rise of the positive cases. Our police officers ensure our safety and the implementation of these rules. Uh, and even the public went their way and expressed their care through generosity for our countrymen. But the question remains, what did we do? What did the academe do to help this country fight COVID-19 and minimize the gap between those who are able to provide and not? So as you can see in the diagram, uh, this is a picture of um, one of the analysis that we did. Now, a lot of interventions shown in the bottom of this diagram have been devised and implemented by different stakeholders and policymakers to minimize the risks. So these risks are shown in the purple boxes at the mid of the slide. So the challenge now is how do we ensure that the interventions implemented are still effective and useful even to this time? So with this in mind, we developed a method that integrates risk management tools into healthcare decision-making process to enhance the understanding and utilization of risk-based thinking in public health decision-making. And this was published in a reputable risk analysis international journal. So it was mentioned earlier uh, during my introduction that I had a background in uh, mining and in the engineering sector. And true enough, we were able to successfully implement uh, this process uh, in the organization for engineering processes. And this is what we adapted and was validated for public health services. So for the risk management process, we base it on the ISO 31000 International Standard for Risk Framework, as shown in the slide. And this process of managing the risk can be broken down into four stages. So risk identification is basically identifying the risk, its sources, areas of impacts, events and causes, and their potential consequences. Meanwhile, risk analysis, in which we try to understand the sources and causes of identified risk, we can also identify the positive and negative consequences. So we're not just reducing the negative consequence, we're also looking at how to optimize or maximize opportunities as a result of these events. The likelihood that those consequences can occur and we can provide inputs to risk evaluation and decide whether these risks can be treated or not. Third stage will be the risk evaluation where we compare risk analysis results with criteria or the risk criteria. This is where the context specific um, interventions come in because we understand that each region, for example, in BARM or in region 11 may not have a similar set of risk criteria. So in that case, uh, we would like to tailor fit the risk criteria to whatever is appropriate to your region or location. So to, to determine whether the residual risk is tolerable, uh, this is also the criteria that we are using. So this will also tell us which risks need to be prioritized. Again, that could differ from one place to another for the treatment implementation, which leads us to finally the risk treatment. We try as much as we can to change the magnitude and likelihood of the consequences or the impacts, no? both positive and negative, to achieve an ideal situation. So I may say in the case of COVID-19, it is really to make it uh, on a controllable uh, level. No, something that can be controlled by our decision makers. So in the project that I am leading, which is Project Resilience, we are deeply motivated to implement the bottom-up approach, which is why we conducted, as you can see in the slide, series of field works outside Region 11. We also did focus group discussions and key informant interviews. So this is for us to see the actual situations on the ground. 
In fact, we invited different stakeholders, uh, not just limited to medical practitioners. We invited infectious disease specialists, representatives from the government, economic players, and private sectors, and asked about their perspective on what is the possible threats and consequences of an uncontrolled COVID-19 outbreak. So furthermore, the data provided by the different regions in Mindanao and hospital help us identify the risk factors that significantly affect the contractability, severity, and survivability of COVID-19 cases in Mindanao. So Resilience is joined by three other projects. So our project is not just one in this. Um, to help us identify and explore the different potential sources of risks of COVID-19. So together, we are part of a much bigger program called Amdabid's Health, which will be explained in detail by our program leader, leader Professor Mata. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jern. Um, I'm really excited to share with you about our research initiatives in the first ever Center for Applied Modeling, Data Analytics, and Bioinformatics for Decision Support Systems in Health. Um, or what we call AMDABIDS Health. By the way, this center is being funded under the DOST PCHRD NICER program and this consists of four project components, namely Project PIPASTOL, which deals with disease data analysis and modeling case projections or forecasting, um, the Resilience Project, which specializes on integrated disease risk management, um, the EWAS Project, which analyzes COVID-19 in wastewater to map the risk of community exposure, and Project VATAS, which assesses the vulnerability of green spaces in uh, the city to emerging infections from wildlife virus reservoir. While it is obvious not that each project do different things. Uh, what the projects have in common is that they follow the risk management process uh, that was explained earlier by Dr. Logrosa. So in connection with the risk management process, uh, we started off now with risk identification. I should say that across all projects, a series of consultations, coordination meetings, and field work with stakeholders and key officials were held. Our goal here is to have an inclusive gathering of information where insights are, are gathered from the grassroots. In this way, together, we identify the most relevant risks that each project focuses on. In terms of risk analysis, the program implemented various methodologies to analyze the different, the different potential risks, knowing the variance of concern, for instance, and the, and the um, implemented control interventions. To name a few of these methodologies, we conducted viral phylodynamic mapping, spatial hotspots, and even bow tie analysis. And for instance, just to emphasize this part or this aspect of risk management process in Project VATAS, what they did is they conducted a biodiversity assessment and hotspot analysis uh, in, in green spaces in Davao City to identify uh, areas that are at high risk for emerging infectious diseases. Um, their results actually showed that 61 out of 184 barangays in Davao City are biodiversity hotspots for beta coronaviruses with a 99% confidence level. In this study, what can we do about that? Well, we can quantify the odds of having new outbreak and the likelihood for a region to be a source of new epidemic in the future. And this finding also supports policy implications related to biodiversity conservation in the region. In Project EWAS, they were able to establish the usefulness of wastewater-based uh, epidemiology method as a cost-effective surveillance technique from their analysis um, of their water uh, samples collected from the sewer pipes or creeks in barangays with moderate to high risk cases of COVID-19 transmission in Davao. SARS-CoV-2 RNA was detected in 22 samples, regardless of the presence of new cases. So this surveillance method aids in classifying the risk of COVID-19 exposure among communities with low testing capacity or no testing facility at all. For the risk evaluation aspect, the projects implemented a variety of evaluation measures to determine the significance of the identified risks. So here we highlight the result of PIPA stall project, wherein we started with formulating a general model that uses early pandemic uh, monitoring data 
and uh, that uh, that model is uh, has already been published as you can see on the slide and this model was then modified to capture the current transmission dynamics of covid-19 using our regional uh, reported data and we eventually used the said model to make simulations and provide precise estimates for the rate for the rates of transmission of covid-19 recovery rate death rate progression rate and hospital utilization rate for various various levels of quarantine the model was also used to make disease forecasts per province and health districts in mindanao region these measurements and figures were also presented in situational reports among participating regional offices of the oh as well as prov provincial health offices and the reports have supported the planning of controls to be implemented in the region. All right. Now, yeah, I, I've shared all this state-of-the-art methodologies, but after applying all, all these methods, um, what now? How will all these efforts reach the marginalized? How will we answer uh, their call for social justice? Well, as, our, as researchers, our, 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 answer, our answer to this call is really simple, and it is through this Disease Watch or DIWA app. So what is DIWA app? It's a virtual planning tool and integrative platform to empower decision makers for pandemic management in Mindanao. Now, the end user of this web-based app are mainly the LGUs and health agencies, especially those uh, those uh, officials that are decision makers. No? In fact, personnel from DOH Davo CHD and the South Cotabato Integrated Provincial Health Office have already beta tested the system. Currently, we are reaching out to other health agencies in Mindanao to include them as well in beta testing. And we foresee that this app uh, will become a system that will be used for disease risk, risk response. Um, and just so you know, in less than two years, our center is currently providing insights covering le all levels of data analytics, namely um, descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive analytics. We intend to expand this analytics tool to other, disease, to other diseases with the continued support of our partner agencies. Um, presently, there are very few statisticians, no? if you know that, and very few quantitative analysts in every regional health offices. But our center provides justice to these agencies by means of the DIWA tool, because this tool automatically will clean, process, and analyze the disease data. Instead of them spending much time doing the manual data analysis work, the technical personnel and the decision makers can focus on making strategic plans to control the, the epidemic, thereby, thereby offering a timely response to potential new surges. In addition, we aid in solving the issue uh, on misinformation and disinformation because because we provide accurate information about the transmission dynamics of the disease. Um, another thing, forecasting uh, is one of the uh, most powerful as a feature of DIWA, and the app can be used to forecast hospitalized cases, which has implication to the preparation of hospital beds or medical equipment needed in advance. And this prevents hospital from reaching full capacity, hopefully, equating to less exhausted staff. Um, uh, it's not shown here, but I have to mention that our phylodynamic analysis shows that the reported cases are too low compared to the actual infectious population. The question is, who are this undetected infectious population? Probably those who do not have access to testing facilities or those who cannot afford to be tested. Um, and I think, yeah, I have to also feature this one. This is a little bit uh, controversial. When it comes to vaccination schedules, there has been some issues that during the first few release of the vaccines, officials would keep their preferred vaccines for themselves and for their family members. Some offices also don't know where to set up stations for, for vaccinations, causing people to settle for whatever vaccines they can get a hold on to, or even cause the wastage of vaccines due to expiry. So with our vaccine uh, vaccination rollout feature in DIWA, we can give you a systematic way on how regions should uh, set up vaccination stations, how many stations to set up, and how many vaccines should be distributed. Um, this way, everyone will have the chance to have access to the vaccine, vaccine stations. And now, um, I think it's my turn to uh, give or turn over this talk to Dr. Jern for other features of DIWA. Dr. Jern? Thank you, Dr. Mata. So to continue on the screen is the regional bow tie map. 
uh, which is under the risk management module. So it highlights the efforts that are being made across the different levels of governance. So this method reveals the activities done by different sectors across different regions. So it is possible no, to put to illustrate everything, all the efforts into one uh, visualization model. Botai, as its definition, will tell us which interventions are useful and futile. So having a systematic identification of control interventions will then help us in preventing prolonged and unnecessary lockdowns and inadequate food reliefs. So a very good example for evidence-based um, policy. So I think this is the last point and the most important uh, for me personally. COVID is deadly. We already know that and it's something that can stop the world. It is really important for us to contain and manage it as much as we can, especially in reducing the fatalities. With the proportion of the influx of COVID-19 patients and the shortage of resources during outbreaks, how can we academicians support and medical practitioners in reducing COVID-19 related fatalities? Or even, God forbid, another outbreak. So hopefully we would be more prepared this time. That's why uh, we present to you our triaging module. This will potentially aid medical practitioners and emergency personnel in determining which patients need immediate attention based on their patient information and clinical information such as symptoms and comor comorbidities. So this will also help uh, avoid the crowding in our hospitals. So this module is basically a triaging strategy using survival analysis, wherein we can compute the hazard ratio of a patient, which is the chance or likelihood of the patient dying from COVID-19. And this will assist health professionals in evaluating prognosis in order to provide proper and immediate treatment. So all these to our DIWA will help Mindanao address the different social injustices brought about by this pandemic. Note that this is not a perfect system yet, and even far from perfect, but this is a big step already toward giving Mindanao a fighting chance in alleviating the furies that we are currently facing. And this is actually not just an ordinary tool. This is Mindanaoan. So DIWA is made by Mindanaoan for Mindanao. We made sure that this platform came from the grassroots of an inclusive and holistic approach to disease management, giving everyone an equal chance in participating in the policymaking, which will directly affect their lives in the region. Therefore, giving justice to our fellow men in Mindanao. And of course, I would like to take this chance to acknowledge um, our researchers and personnel because this won't be possible without them. From the beginning, they have been the ones uh, that really pursued all the methodologies and generating the reports. And they're the ones who tirelessly reach out to possible collaborators and research partners. So let me close this by borrowing a quote from Helen Keller that we have been using since our first few presentation. So alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. So along with Professor Mata, thank you very much. Daghang salamat po.